So seeing as we're starting a new section, I wanted to do a very brief recap of what we've already discussed. We started off the class with quite a bit of history. Um, the first week was all just trying to get a, a, a hold on the various views of the mind that were going to come up throughout the class, and, and most of them already have. Um, we discussed the ancients, rationalists, empiricists, some early neuroanatomy, which will come up today, mentalism, which came up during the consciousness discussion, behaviorism, um, and, and so on. We then discussed the theoretical background um, so that we could understand cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience. The idea was computers and information theory were very essential early on, and some philosophy of science is actually going to come up again and again in most of these discussions and, and already has, usually within the context of whether something is real or not, scientific realism. We then discussed cognitive science, uh, which built on the computer and information metaphor to make sense of the mind in the 20th century. Cognitive neuroscience, which used new techniques and, and technologies to investigate the brain, and then seeing how they all integrated. The next uh, big section was um, mental architectures. We started off with the idea of a representational theory of mind, namely that our mind somehow represents the world around us. Um, in the way that text represents words or uh, pictures represent people. Um, language of thought hypothesis was an approach to this that took the computer metaphor very seriously and said that there was some uh, in, inbuilt hardware in our mind that was already sort of like a pre-built uh, language that we had uh, sort of a, a proto-language already fit, built into how we organize our thoughts. Um, this led us to the discussion about whether machines could think, which was a fun uh, class discussion, you guys might remember. Connectionism was an alternative approach, and at first it seemed like it was in conflict, but it turned out that you could actually develop hybrid architectures between connectionists and, and these classical computational uh, approaches to, to mental architecture. We then talked about consciousness, the easy and hard problem. Um, to try to make sense of how we how our consciousness worked. We questioned the possibility that it might be a, an illusion of some sort, and in fact that maybe all of our um, reasoning might be illusory, uh, that we might be guided more by some instinct or some uh, fast processing than, than deliberative processing. Um, and that took us to a discussion of perception and concepts which tied back into consciousness, it tied back into um, innate, or, sorry, uh, computational theories, it, it tied back into mental architectures. The basic idea is um, how we perceive the world, how we understand it, and how we group the world, and whether that or not that's innate. So the next couple of lectures are gonna focus on some biology, which will hopefully um, uh, help us understand a lot of what we've already talked about, but in a, from a different light. Um, before we get to that, I want to discuss something called mo modularity. Modularity um, is a principle of design. It appears, and you see that in, in um, basically any thing that you've ever seen that's designed. It basically means parts that can fit together with each other um, neatly, so you can rearrange parts of it, there's uh, discrete modules, so to speak. Um, and we're gonna consider two alternative views. The modularity of the mind view proposed by Jerry Fodor, who was a big uh, proponent of the language of thought hypothesis and the classical computationalist um, of mental architecture. We're gonna um, explore his view of modularity, which is gonna uh, follow directly from our discussion of, of perception. Then we're going to discuss an alternative view called massive modularity, which will uh, lead us into the, the next lecture. And then we're going to debate, debate the two. The background for this is I want you to re recall the video, um, the lecture on early neuroanatomy, specifically the discussion of phrenology. This is the view that uh, the brain has multiple innate separate localized faculties. So that's all of the part that's going to be relevant here. Uh, phrenology also thought that the brain influenced the skull's formation, that you could tell 
um, people's characteristics by feeling their skull, which is not going to be what we care about at the moment. Just this innate, separate, and localized faculties. Also, the discussion of mental architectures, uh, essentially any non-connection, or at least not completely connectionist mental architecture is going to require some form of modularity. Uh, otherwise, the entire system could break down very quickly. Um, and then perception from the last week. Uh, why that's relevant is going to be very, very apparent soon. So the modularity of the mind uh, view, Fodor uh, proposes that maybe we should have be thinking um, early phrenologists, that he argues that there are certain innate psychological mechanisms that are domain specific, mandatory, and encapsulated. Um, these have features, sorry, ah. um, these modules, um, we can think about them in, in two very different ways. One might be horizontally, that is that the mind is organized in terms of general capacities uh, and abilities, and um, vertically. So Fodor is going to argue for a vertical approach where the mind is organized um, top down. So there's a central uh, operator, and then there's many peripheral systems that it um, operates over. Um, We'll talk about horizontal organization when we get to the massive modularity, which will be after this. So, remember perception. When we talk, when you think about perception, you know, hearing, sight, sound, whatever, um, there's a part of it that involves unconscious in inferences. There's something about how the world works um, and how you expect it to work that your mind are automatically processes. And it's not uh, just a reflex, right? Like you look at the world and you group it, you perceive it. You don't automatically like, uh, I mean, unless there's like a shoe heading toward your head, you don't automatically duck. The vast majority of it is just gathering information. Um, so when we think about perception, you can think about two uh, possible claims with respect to it. One is that it is, it involves processing the world around you. You might think about it as computational, but it is, you, there is information uh, under some definitions of information, Shannon theory of information, which we've discussed in this class, and you are perceiving it and, and uh, understanding it. Another separate claim is that the perception that you have is encapsulated. You don't need to think about every object. You don't need to recall things fully. You don't need to um, be consciously aware of all of your perception. Early cognitivist um, approaches, people that uh, were pushing for a classical computational view, uh, accepted the first one. They, they thought that that was um, an obvious way of understanding how perception works, perceptual processes. Um, they didn't have so much to say about encapsulation. But Fodor is going to emphasize this idea, the idea that there might be some discreteness to our um, perceptual processing. Um, there's two arguments for this. Um, the second one's the one that I'm going to focus on, but the first one I just want to say is, if you recall the poverty of the stimulus argument, right, like um, with, this was originally applied to language, but you can think about it in, in, in all sorts of different respects. What you see is not entirely determined by what you look at. What you hear is not entirely determined by what you uh, by the sounds around you. And you know this is true if you've ever heard somebody speak a language you don't understand. The information that is processed differently depending on how you experience the world, um, what you expect to see, what you expect to experience. And somehow your mind transforms it. Um, 
there's an infinite number of ways to do it. Um, and yet we nevertheless come up with a couple of repeating clusters, right? You think in terms of objects being permanent. You don't think in terms of them popping in and out of existence. So there's something else going on. There's some automatic, there's some processing going on. And it's not just chance. The second one is this idea that um, some perceptual systems are not cognitively penetrable. We talked about that in the, um, in the perception lecture. Here's two other well-known optical illusions. I've given optical illusions in previous slides or in previous lectures. But on the left, and, and I promise you this is true, I just copied and pasted the, um, the red and blue lines and rotated them or flipped them. But all of the red lines on all of those boxes are the same length. You can like go up to your screen and measure them if you want. All of the blue lines are also the same length. It's the same with the green lines on the right image. Those are the, the same length as well. Um, they don't look that way. And it doesn't even matter that you've measured these. It doesn't matter what you do. You cannot stop but perceiving them uh, as different lengths. There's something about the other information on the screen that forces you to misrepresent the green lines or the red and blue lines. It just does. Um, it's, this is what's called cognitive impenetrability. The idea that it doesn't matter how much you try to reason yourself to viewing something differently, you just cannot. So, Fodor has kind of a cool little example on this. He says, uh, imagine your best friend. I, sometimes I do this with students in class. You know, turn to the, the person you trust the most and um, convince yourself as hard as you can that they would never jab you in the eye. They would never ever poke you, you in the eye. And then one person has to um, get really, really close enough to try to poke them. And your eyes will blink. You can try this with your friends, but, but I, trust me, like, if you're cognitively normal, this is what, what will happen. Um, you will flinch. And so, I mean, like the optical illusions, this shows that there's some cognitive impenetrability of at least sight in, in perception. Fodor has a lot of other um, properties that he thinks modules uh, exhibit. These properties include um, being domain specific, being about one particular thing, uh, informationally encapsulated, it's usually insensitive to other information from other modules, fast, mandatory, and bottom-up, possibly innate, possibly using fixed neural architecture, and possibly having specific breakdown patterns. In the third section of this lecture, probably in the next video, we'll talk about um, how likely we expect all of those to be the case for, for all modules. There's some examples you can think of, right? Color perceptions, shape and size analysis, face recognition, voice recognition, uh, parsing uh, language. Uh, and for Fodor, what's going on with these is that the, these modules process the world around you and they serve as inputs to a central processing. And the central processing, you might also call it the Fodorian executive. This is a general processing system. This is the opposite in a lot of ways of uh, these modules. These are going to be domain, this is going to be domain general, global, deep, unencapsulated, slow, and largely under voluntary control. So you might think about drawing an analogy between this and the, um, the behavioral economics discussion, where we talked about fast and slow systems. I think there's an interesting analogy there. I don't know how far to take it, but it's one thing to take to consider. Central processing 
is sensitive to global properties and is not encapsulated, which means it's probably really hard to study, but it might be most important. And in fact, um, some people might say that that is the, the you voice, the um, thoughts, the problem solving that we all experience. Um, the ability to form sentences, propositional attitudes, being aware of your aroundness, the this is the thing that is the you, so to speak. Um, at least that's the view. And we'll talk about whether this makes sense as well in the um, third section of this uh, talk, which will come in the next video. I'll stop this one here and move on to the next two in the next video.